some people trickling in. Okay. Uh, I want to introduce myself first. I am Aurora, and I have been volunteering to organize youth programs for DCBA for over a year now, and only very recently started doing these um, virtual programs. So we're really glad to have you guys here with us. Um, we have a very special guest today, um, an author of Creek Critters, and her name is Jennifer Keats Curtis, and she's going to read the book today and then we're going to have the chance to ask her questions so if oh, you can oh i'm going to the blog mama mm -hmm. so try to go on try to get that on mute if you can um okay so jennifer the stage is Without yours further ado. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Aurora. <laughs> hi everybody yeah. i'm so glad to join aurora today um my name is jennifer keats curtis most kids just call me JKC for short, since so three names is not a lot for anyone. And I am the author of uh, my 25th book will be coming out this fall. Um, Creek Critters is one of my newer books, and I was very excited to share it with you today. Thank you, Aurora, for asking. Um, I actually do not have a science background, um, but I sure do wish I did. It turns out that I love science. I just didn't know about it. So. Over my last uh, several books, I have had the opportunity to work with different kinds of scientists to learn about different areas of science. And then I like to write stories because that is the way that I like to learn. So Creek Critters is a realistic fiction and the kids in the story are not real. I made them up, but everything else in the story is true. So you will see information about bugs in there and how we can look for certain kinds of bugs in water to figure out if the water is clean. And I didn't make up any of the science part, just the kids in the story. I sort of thought about all the kids I talked about when I was learning this information and combined them into the two kids in the story, the brother and sister in the story. Uh, shall we read? Yeah, let's jump right in. We have the... All right. The cover here first. I don't well, know if you wanted to introduce that. Yep. Thank you. The name of the book is called Creek Critters. And I was so lucky to work with this awesome illustrator. Her name is Phyllis Saroff. And together we made some, um, we created some different kinds of ideas about the best way to show how these kids are going to look for critters in the creek. In that bottom right hand corner, that boy and girl, they were the models who posed as the brother and sister for the story. So that is a real picture in the bottom there. And you can see that we would say Phyllis Seraph is a realistic painter because doesn't, doesn't the cover, doesn't it look just like that boy and the girl in the photograph? And then that little bug up at the top who looks like the letter C, that's called a net spinning caddisfly. And Phyllis used that critter as a model for the C in Creek Critters. And maybe you are looking closely now and you see that some of those other letters might have some bugs in them as well. Anybody see those besides the big dragonfly over the top? I just think you guys can give thumbs cool. up if you want to. If you agree, you could give a thumbs up. Oh, good idea. You there see you the go. bugs in the letters? So cool, isn't it? So we started right away with all the learning. And then of course, on the bottom of the cover of the story, you can also see some pictures of real bugs which I was very excited to have scientists and kids help me find when we went out to a fresh water creek in Pennsylvania. Okay, let's jump in. All right. Lucas, let me show you how bugs can tell a story of clean water, I say to my little brother, wiggling my eyebrows. He hates that. Anybody else have a little brother or sister who can get on their nerves sometimes on purpose? I see a few of them together in the video. <laughs> Don't tell my brother I said that. Lucas rolls his eyes but follows me to the house. We grab the same tools that scientists use. Rubber boots, a net, a bucket, and small paintbrushes. We tug on our boots and head back to the freshwater creek. Anybody know what the paintbrushes are for? You think they're painting? Anybody have any ideas? Oh, let's find out. Go lump. We step right into the water. This part of the creek is called a ripple. It's shallow and the water runs fast enough over the rocks to make a bubbling noise. Downstream is a pool. It's deep and the water is calm. 
I slash water into our bucket and plop it next to a tall sycamore tree. Quickly, I spin around before Lucas can push me in. That water is cold. I'm going to open my book, Aurora, just in case I can't see sure. over where our kids are in the corner. Like a team of scientists, we work together searching for bugs that can only live in healthy water. Aquatic macroinvertebrates, or macros for short, is the fancy name for these creatures. If you break down the word, it's easy to understand. Aquatic means water. Macro means big, in this case, big enough to see with our eyes. No microscope needed. Invertebrate means no backbone. Young macros, called larvae, or nymphs, live in water. As they grow older, some kinds of macros change. They go through metamorphosis. Can I get a thumbs up for anybody who knows what metamorphosis is? Yes. These adults fly around and live near the water, while only adults may spend their whole lives underwater. I yank up a rock. Lucas and I check the slimy bottom, nothing. We wade over two steps. I snag a smaller gray stone for inspection. There's some weird looking crawler with big eyes on there, Lucas says very unscientifically. I carefully scrape the bug into the bucket. He's a small but mighty dragonfly nymph. The young dragonfly spurts around like he's wearing a jetpack. He sucks water in and spurts it out back, zooming from one side to the other. We put some sticks and leaves in the bucket so he can hide. Lucas flips over another rock. I spy what looks like the smallest turtle I've ever seen. It's hanging on for dear life. It's actually a water penny, a beetle larva whose back looks like a turtle's shell. These beetles don't like creeks with pollution or muddy buildup called sediment. We put the water penny in the bucket. I need, give me a thumbs up if you see the paintbrush. Do you see the paintbrush? So helps make that helps make those bugs go into the bucket very gently. Yeah, I would say, and this is my favorite macro. I just think it's cute. They <laughs> I think are I like cute, the aren't name they? too. They're so fun to find. <laughs> a water penny. Yeah. Plus, it's a fun name. Mm-hmm. You can probably tell these camouflage creek critters are hard to spot. They can be as small as your eyelash or as big as your thumb. They hide under, in, and around stones and pebbles. Some skitter into large bunches of leaves called leaf packs. You can scoop up the pack with a net and slowly sift through it to check what's in there. We really want to find mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. These bugs are the most sensitive to pollution. They often can't live in dirty water. If we find them, we will know our creek is healthy. I was so excited to learn that. That's so cool. Now, anytime I go to a creek, I'm looking for the water bugs. That's right. Yeah, and I'm noticing if you look really closely at the pictures, you might find a water penny on this page. But it's you might. Hard you have to, to like, almost like an eye spy, right? You have to look really hard. Yep. Lucas and I push the net underwater along the creek's edge. We shuffle our feet, kicking around so lots of stuff floats into our net. I pull up a hunk of rotting leaves, one of the best bug hiding places. Of course, Lucas grabs a slimy leaf and flings it at me. Ugh, Lucas is always doing stuff like that. I wipe off the brown goo with a groan. He looks a little devilish in that picture. He's pretty excited to be getting his sister all gooey, isn't he? We quietly stare into the net. It's hard, but you have to be patient. And I, this is the part that I am not very good at. The itty bitty bugs are almost the same color as the leaves and are so small that you have to look for movement to find them. There, a caddisfly larvae pokes his head out of a homemade case of rocks, leaves, and twigs. This crafty critter creates his house using sticky silk as underwater glue. Lucas gently plunks him into the bucket. Before moving on, we examine the rest of the net to make sure there are no more bugs. They'll die if they dry out. So cool. You can see the adult there on the page and the nymph. I know, and what's so yeah. cool is that you have, it's 
so hard to find these bugs and the babies don't look anything like their parents. Mm -hmm. A lot like a caterpillar and butterfly, That's right? right? Yeah. Now it's Lucas's turn to scoop with the net. We shuffle our feet again and a heap of gray gooey leaves slides in. As we pluck out the last leaf, Lucas spots a six-legged bug with three tails and fluttering gills. It's a mayfly nymph. We add him to the bucket where the other bugs creep, shuffle, curl up, and hide. And I love how Phyllis Seroff, the illustrator, she helps us to see the baby, the nymph, and the full-grown one so we know what the difference is between the two with that real picture there. Yeah, that's wonderful. I have a little um, trick that I always used in my mind for a mayfly when I was learning these bugs, how they have, not all of them have the three tails, but most of them do. Some have two. But um, I, the, the three tails kind of in my imagination look, reminds me of the letter M. And so I think oh, mayfly. Yeah. That's good. I like so, that. It's a little that's trick. Awesome. You're exactly right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's helpful. I peer into the bucket, but don't see the dragonfly. There he is, stuck to a stick. We can't leave him in there too long. Dragonflies are predators. They may eat our other new friends. Can you see him? He's a pretty good at camouflaging himself. Aurora, are you able to point to him? Using the oh, yeah. The pointer, okay. sorry. Yeah. You see, you see him all the way down? Yeah, there, he is. there he is. Pretty good at, pretty good at hiding, isn't he? He wants to get back in the water. Yes. Although I really want today's adventure to include a stonefly nymph, we have found special macros, such as the mayfly and caddisfly that live in clean water. Lucas now knows how water bugs can tell tales. And do you see any bugs in this picture? That one's down in the front. Yeah, and this is uh, an adult stonefly, right? Yeah, so I love how they're looking for the nymph, but there's the adults hiding out in the leaves. <laughs> so fun. With that in mind, my brother and I decide to call it a day. We take our storytelling macroinvertebrates back down to the creek. I smile, and together, we turn the bucket over into the water, returning the bugs to their home. And in this picture, you can, if you look, you can see some of the bugs that they had found. Maybe that's that already got down from the bucket. Yep. You see those the mayflies and the water penny. <laughs> water penny. That's right. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you're um, welcome. I know that there's a few more pages in the back of the book that we could just briefly share mm -hmm. if you'd like. Sure. So yes, one of the reasons that I love working with this company so much, Arbordale Publishing, is that as a kid and even as an adult, one of my favorite ways to learn was in a story. And then I would get so excited about the things that I had learned in that story that I wanted more and more information. And Arbordale Publishing has a special section in the back called For Creative Minds where I get to add on the science to the story itself. So in that first part, it's a scavenger hunt where you have a chance to look for those different kinds of bugs that we just learned about. And then on the next page, there's a matching game so we can figure out which bugs belong to which, which what they look like as nymphs or larvae as babies, and then what they look like as adults. And mm -hmm. I tell you what, Aurora, your M trick is really going to come in handy. I love yeah, that. yeah, that's, because <laughs> I always felt like the mayflies and the stoneflies when I was learning them looked pretty similar to me they and they're do. so tiny. They really um, do. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's super fun is once somebody points out a trick like that, it makes it so much easier to find them. That's why it's mm -hmm. so fun to work with scientists. Definitely. And then the last section of the book, that first page is called the scientist field notebook. And you could take that down to your creek with you and act like a scientist. What you see, what you smell, uh, maybe even what you hear, how that water is running, and you could take notes so that you could figure out how healthy your waterway is. And not only do you get to check off certain items, then there's a box at the bottom so you can write your own notes. Maybe you see something really interesting. Who knows? Maybe you see like a turtle or another animal down there, and you want to make sure maybe you take some notes about that also and even draw a picture. And then on the following page where it says, is your creek healthy, ask the critters, you have a chance to take a look at three different groups of insects 
And if you find insects in that first group where it says that they're very sensitive, if you see them, you know that that water must be clean because it's really hard for them to live in water that's polluted. And in the second section, they can tolerate pollution a little bit. Um, and then in the third section, those guys are pretty good at living where they, where they need to live. So even if the water is polluted, you might, you might find them there. My personal favorite would be the rat-tailed maggots. <laughs> mm. You actually see one wants of those? To see those. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that there's these um, things in the back too, as well. And um, I went on the Arbordale Publishing website and um, if you, when I went to Arbordale Publishing and then books and then found Creek Critters. And on the page, you can not only order the book, but it also has teaching activities and links to things to expand the learning beyond the story. It's right. fantastic. And it's all, those are all free, whether you buy the book or not. You're more than welcome to use those for any of the books on, on there. Yeah. So it's pretty helpful. It's fun. I like the science part of that. Cool stuff like bingo games and some art projects, which are really, which are really fun. Yeah. And then, okay, so I just thought, what, oh. There, I forgot we had this on here too. No, no, no. That's about about the, you want, the you want illustrations me to show that very quickly. Yeah. So I'm very lucky, I, but I am a words person. So my job is to come up with the stories and write down the words. And I have the chance to work with some amazing illustrators like Phyllis Sarah, who need to see my words and, in their head and then use some pictures to create sketches before they paint. In this case, Phyllis is a painter to paint that in and get the color. So I thought you might be interested in seeing what it looks like as she goes through her process. And in that up top and the left, she did everything in black and white. And we had a chance to go and make sure that the words matched the pictures. And once we decided they did, that's my last chance really to make any edits. She went back and she painted everything in. And I just love the way she did that. The illustrations really are beautiful. She's amazing. She really is. I've been lucky. I've had a chance. I work with her on a book called Maggie, Alaska's Last Elephant. And then we have one coming out this fall called The Pooper Snoopers. Okay. Dogs that help scientists track endangered animals by finding their scat or their poop. Ooh. Sounds great. Um, do you, I have a question about that. Do you, how does like the author illustrator relationship work? Like, do you request an illustrator to work with, or is that partly determined by a publisher? Um, yeah, so it is. So in my case, um, I've been really lucky. I've been, uh, I work with three different publishing companies, but this is the one I work with the most. And because we've developed a relationship over the, over the years, um, Cooper Snoopers will be my 19th book with them. I have a little bit more say about who I work with. And in the case of Cooper Snoopers, the story idea was actually Phyllis's. She okay. wanted to do this book, um, but she is not a writer. So she wanted me to write it so she could do the illustrations. But quite often the publisher it, it, the assigns the illustrators. Okay. Um, and we don't get a chance to talk to each other uh, until the very end, until the illustrations are already out. Because sometimes what authors see in their head is not the same thing that illustrators see in their head. Yeah. So they some, don't, sometimes don't like us to work together like that. Okay. All right. That's so interesting to have that insight. I try to be very all. clear with my words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the, the background of the, how these things get done. Yeah. It's fun. And I love, I just wanted to show you this. I just love this. So Phyllis used some of the photographs that I was able to get while working with the Stroud uh, to work with the Stroud Research Center. And then she used that in order to create sketches and then the illustrations. So you can see that water penny, which does look like a little turtle on the back. And this is one of the pictures that she used so that she could show the water penny in the illustrations in the book. And they really do sort of cling on to the back of those stones like that. Yeah. And using that paintbrush gets them off very softly without hurting yeah. them. Yeah, you wouldn't want to use your finger and no, be delicate. That's right. Yep. And I kind of like gross stuff. So in that top left corner, that's the biofilm that we were seeing on those rocks. And at the bottom, that's Dr. Steve Curlin from the Stroud Research Center. He's the director of education there. And he and a group of third graders were nice enough to um, take me out and show me how to find all this. And we really put on our boots and we got our nets and we were very careful about what we found. 
So he's, he led our fearless group into the very cold water in order to look for those bugs. And in the top corner, can anybody guess what that is? We talked about it a little bit in the story. We scoop, we scoop them up into a net. Do you know what that is? If you said leaf packet, you are right. And you can definitely tell that's a packet of leaves. So it looks nice and clean on the top, but when you scoop it up on the bottom, it's super gross. It's gooey and brown. And if you have a little brother or sister with you, they might just be so tempted to throw a gross leaf at you because they just can't help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the bottom, those are some of the bugs that we found while we were out there, just like in the story. And of course we did use a paintbrush to make sure that we didn't hurt any of the bugs. And when we were done, we also turned over that bucket very gently and returned those, you know, those critters right back to their creek. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I think I have just just a really quick wanted to show you guys what mayflies scooting around would look like. I don't know if you can try to spot their three tails in there. I see one. Yep. Thumbs up. Anybody else see one with three tails? Do you see the three tails of the mayflies? Very cool. All right. So that is um, on the Stroud Water Research Center YouTube channel. They have, if you ever want to get a better, you know, a nice close up look of some of these bugs moving around in water, um, they have that on their YouTube channel with all all different types of macroinvertebrates. So, and I can send out some links um, that Jennifer provided and to the, to the publisher and some other resources to learn more about macros. I can send them out to everybody after this webinar. Um, so now I think we should maybe open it up for questions. Um, I wanna first see if any of our participants have any questions and if you do you can unmute or you can use the chat function um, as well and Sue I don't know if you can um, view the chat function easier than I am because I'm sharing my screen uh, yes um, we have two people talk um, said uh, Rosalind said, we saw some of the bugs before, and oh, Jen good. said, John, he likes the dragonfly nymphs. Me too. And then we have, thank you so much for hosting and presenting this. Aww. We loved it. Good. Who awesome. knew bugs could be so fun? You yeah. guys can unmute yourself if you want to talk and ask a question. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a statement. Go for okay. it. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, Jennifer Keith C. JKC. First of all, I want to chat with you afterward, but I wanted to mention Aurora that this is the letter M in sign language. Take your. Oh. Hi. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay. All right. I got M. Three tails. Oh, nice. And that that's not the up. in the word May. So. Perfect. And Johnny, yes. I have to say, I was a little intimidated to go after you. What was that? So I got a chance to see your presentation last week, which was awesome. Yeah. And I thought, I, and I thought, totally, I said, I am not singing because nobody would stay on for that. But it was fabulous. It was so, it was such a great entertainment and education at the same time. Too. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Connie. I learned something new. Yeah. yeah. Well, me too. This is, this is a beautiful book. Thank yeah. you. Um, do, do any, does anyone else have a question? I think I see Jojo. Do you have your hands up? Yeah. Go ahead. You know what the bugs eat in the creek? What? Do you, know the, do you already know the answer or are you asking me? I'm asking. I, you know what? I do not know what they eat. I think they eat what's in the water in front of them. I might have to look, I might have to look that up and get back to you. That's an excellent question. I'm not really sure. Well, I know I can answer, I can answer uh, not completely, but I know, for example, like dragonflies are predators, so they eat other bugs. Right. Um, and then there's, some of the macros are called shredders because they shred like the leaves and things. Okay. They're, they're, 
eating um, the, the plant material. So I can't go into more detail than that, but some eat plants and some eat other bugs. Just like a lot of other animals, right? Cool. Depending on Very cool, good question. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not a bug. I don't think I wanna be eating that stuff. <laughs> Thank Let's you. see. Thank you for reading us this story today. Oh, thank you um, for listening. I'm so happy uh, Lorna, Lorna has her hand red. I think she wants to ask a question. Okay. Um, what type of freshwater eels live in a creek in Pennsylvania? Because we saw a freshwater eel. Oh, you know what? I thought I saw that. Wow. I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know anything about eels. I wish I did. Um, Laura, uh, do you know? Or Sue? I do know. We actually have an adult video, not an adult video, but um, in our Watershed 101 series, we did um, uh, one on bugs. The invasives. No, I don't, was it invasives or was it Kate's um, <laughs> fish, our local fish? And there's different types of eels that, and then what they do is they swim upstream and then they mate, and then they swim back to somewhere else. You should ask your mom to get the video. It's uh, lunch. It's on our citizen science website, and it's lunch with Kate. And I believe it's for the Darby Creek fish. Yeah, and I can even send that out afterwards. I just oh, need good. To I would like to see that also. Are they? Yeah. Do you know if they're the same eels that start in the Sargasso Sea? It, they are. They start. Okay. There's two different branches. One comes over this way and one go, and the same ones that come down, that go up, they go to the same location. They never switch. Okay. There is a book called Butterfly Something Eel. I'm looking for it. That um, describes the migration of those different Critters. So I'm looking oh, through my wow. bookshelf here, and um, so there's a guy who does a study of eels. Green Valley's Watershed Association has an eel guy who's trying to restore the eel population in, I believe it's French Creek. So um, I believe it's the American eel to answer the question of. Oh, Lauren. that's the right. right? Yeah, I think it's called an American eel. And that's the name. Oh, look. Okay, I got your arm. Do we have another question? Does anyone else have any other questions? Found it. Oh, it's backwards. Bird, butterfly, eel. By oh. Jane Kosick. P R O S E K. And nice. it's a beautiful book that um, kind of describes migration. Very good. I just wrote that down. Thank you, Connie. Um, excuse me? Yes. yes. Did you know that a lot of American eels were actually sighted in the Delaware River? Oh, yeah. I did not know that. I looked it up because I was wondering what type of eel she is. She came from upstream to us, well, because of our hot dogs. <laughs> So in the back of this book, the eels, the bird butterfly eels, there's some information about eels and where they come from and where they're going. Thank and you. You're welcome. Thank you. I did see one other hand up, but I think he may have left. Um, um, okay. Joe has, Roslyn says, Joe has something to say. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. I caught an eel before. <laughs> wow, you caught one? We went fishing. That's okay. Cool. <laughs> you wow. did it go back, right? Did you set it free again? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So should she keep it? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> what if a great big giant came? <laughs> That's from Connie's book last week. Can he keep it? Nay, some of you may have missed that one, but um, we actually have that linked on our website too, if you want to go back and check that out. And um, 
you know, we have a whole series of these going on. This is our second one. We have more lined up. So I hope you guys will stick around and, and see more of them. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? I had a question actually for, for Jennifer. Um, I'm just curious about like the writing process. Like, mm -hmm. is there a certain place you like to write? Do you have like kind of a special place or you just kind of write wherever, you know, wherever yeah, you're inspired? I do, like sit, I do like to sit outside when I can. So I, I do. Um, I'm really lucky. I, I'll have a chance. I live near the water. It seems very inspiring. Um, and then I have a bunch of big trees around my house. So I like to be near that when I do my writing. But sometimes I just have to be in my plain old office. Um, I do have a hard time sitting, so I do stand a lot, especially when I'm doing my research. Um, it seems to help to move around a little bit. And I spend a lot more time doing the research than I do the writing, um, in part because I don't have that science background, but I love learning about it so much. So when I'm really lucky and I have a long deadline, then I get to have a chance to use far, to learn far more than I can actually use in my book. But then I get to pick and choose what goes into the story. And I just, I just love that. And having a chance to work with scientists is so great. It's so much fun. And I learn something new every day. So it's, it's particularly wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like a lot of kids can probably relate to not being able to sit still and to like, you know, having different environments to, to work in. It helps a lot, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Connie? <laughs> Who, who are the kids that you used as your models? So they are not actually my kids. Um, Phyllis Sarup, they're her neighbors. Um, we, so we have been trying to include um, uh, people of color in our stories. When I first started working um, for, with Arborville and I was doing research, I noticed that there were very few kids of color in any of the nature books that I was researching. So we're trying really hard to make sure um, and I, and I suspect same with you, Connie, like I want the kids that I frequently talk to to be able to see themselves in the stories. So her, these are her neighbors and um, she thought they'd be perfect models for this book. And they were, they actually are brother and sister as you could probably tell by looking at them. And they were more than willing to pose for her to do that. How fun. Yeah. Great. Okay, so if that's all of our questions, I'm gonna, I have to scroll through the, oh, I see Jojo has her hands up. Go ahead. Um, do you know if it rains, do the bugs' wings get wet? <laughs> what do you fly? think? I don't know. I bet it depends on the kind of bug and if they go to hide. So I bet they can hide under the leaves, sort of like you might use an umbrella if they need if they need to. You might you are going to be a scientist. I like the way you think. <laughs> Asking questions. questions is always good. Love the questions. <laughs> Me too. Okay, I think I'm just scrolling. I have to scroll through the pictures to see everyone. I don't think anyone else has any questions. So I'm just going to wrap up and say thank you so much to Jennifer Keats Curtis for sharing Creek Critters with us and spending your time with us and telling us about the process of writing. And um, it was really wonderful to have you. Um, let's see. Oh, I just saw another chat pop up. Is that a question? Sorry. Um, somebody, um, oh, it's from Connie saying thank you very much to everyone. Another thank you from Andrea and Margo, Margo and James say bye-bye. Wonderful. Okay. Thank, thank you. you guys so much. Um, I just wanted to say that Darby Creek Valley Association, um, some of you know this already because you, you know, come to our programs. If you haven't, then um, we are a nonprofit and supported by members. And it's been a goal of DCBA to keep our programs free. Um, so they're accessible for anyone and everyone who, um, who has a desire to learn about healthy watershed. Um, but that does mean we rely on donations and supports of our members. So we always appreciate that. And we thank you for coming and spending your time with us. And I will follow up with all of you in an email and send you some links and resources um, and the recording afterwards as well. So thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and thank you all. I hope to see you at another program. Me too. Yeah, I'm looking forward.